Okay, now turn over to Matthew. We're going to continue in our theology of God's goodness. The Gospel of Matthew, New Testament. Keep going to the right. So you get there in the New Testament. Chapter 7, verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, and I think most of you that have children are planning and thinking about gifts you're going to give them, he said, if you earthly, fallen, sinful creatures know how to give good things to those you love, how much more will your Father, Matthew seven eleven, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask Him? Now, you notice this is unfolding, this theology of goodness. Psalm 34 says you've got to taste and see the Lord is good. You, you meet Him. And, and if you take refuge in Him, you'll learn about the goodness. Then in verse 11 of Psalm 84, if we walk uprightly, He won't withhold the good from us. Psalm 119, we have to trust He is good and does good, and then He will teach us how to walk in His way. And now Jesus said, how much more will your Father in heaven give what is good to those who what? Ask. So often we don't have what is good in our life because we don't ask. We don't ask because we don't want to give up going our own way. We're pushing on the scale so hard, we do not come and ask before God and say, I want your way in my life. Your partner, your plan, your direction, your career choice. I don't want to be molded by the world. I want to be molded by you. Now, turn to Romans. Here's a a very big piece in our theology. Romans chapter 8. Keep going to the right. Romans 8, this is the omniscient God who is sovereign. And we absolutely believe that. Don't worry about the stuff we don't understand, the, the, the little tiny details of whatever election and predestination mean. We do know this. Look at verse 28. We know that God causes. He causes. He is sovereignly able to cause all things to work together for good. The active agent is God, and He is causing everything in our life to work together for good. Look at this. To those who love God. You know, when St. Augustine or Augustine read this in the 5th century, Augustine of Hippo, he lived in northern Africa, over in Libya and Tunisia area. When he read this, he formulated his life's philosophy. He said, love God supremely. And do what you please. Now that's the Christian life. Did you know, if we love God more than anything else, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy spirit, and we love our neighbors ourselves, if we love God in that way, God is causing everything to work together for good in our lives. He is making it work together. We just need to see that. Look at verse 32. He underlines how committed he is to us. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? That's the goodness of God. Well, keep going to the right. We have just about three more elements in our theology of goodness. First Thessalonians. Go to the right through the epistles. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, this is an important one. It says this, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. If I am in the refuge of God, and if He is teaching me His statutes, and if I trust Him as good, and if I am seeking Him above all else, and if I am asking Him for good things, and if my life is walking in harmony with Him, then everything He brings into my life, I say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I did not expect that, but that is part of your plan, and I want that, and I embrace that, and I yield to you. That's why Paul says, in everything give thanks. This is God's will, that we be a thank-filled people. Now, keep going to the right. Hebrews 12.10. You say, does that mean that God's always promised, sky's always blue, and flower-strewn pathways all my life through, as the psalm writer put it? No. Hebrews 12.10 says this. Keep going to the right. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. He says, for they... The writer of Hebrews is talking about our parents. Disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. So that means godly parents discipline their children. But the end of verse 10, but he, that's God, disciplines us for good. What happens when we doubt him? What happens when we go the wrong way? What happens when we make wrong choices? What happens when we love ourselves more than him? What happens when we aren't trusting him and we're doubting him? He chastens us. You say, really? He chastens us. For our good. He pulls the wheels off of our life. We, we 
crash, we have flat tires. You know, I'm not talking about literal flat tires. I'm talking about in our life. That all of a sudden there's just this inexplicable resistance and God is resisting me. That's his discipline. What's he saying? I want you to get back on the pathway. I want you to go my way because I want to work everything together for good in your life. And he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. You see, what, what this progressive theology of, of, of goodness is, is that, that goodness, uh, number one, is a refuge if we'll taste and see the Lord. But he won't withhold anything if we'll walk uprightly, if we'll learn his statutes, if we'll ask him, if we'll let him work all things together in our life, and if we'll give thanks in the midst of it. But when we won't do those things, when we don't let him, when we don't listen, when we don't yield, he disciplines us. Because he wants us to share in his holiness. Well, to distill all this down, Satan wants us to doubt the goodness of God. In theological terms, we could say this. God's goodness can be seen in his mercy, and that would be his goodness toward people in distress. God is merciful. God's grace is his goodness toward those who deserve only punishment. That's us, sinners who come to Christ. And God's patience is His goodness toward those who continue to sin. And God is so patient. You know, God told Adam and Eve, in the day you sin, you'll die. They didn't. He gave them 950 years. That's His patience. And look at what God's doing in our world now as people blatantly sin in the face of a holy God. He's patient because His mercy And His grace are operative. Well, what should we do in response to God's goodness? Turn back our last Psalm 116. Okay, back to the middle of your Bible. Psalm 116. I hope it becomes a friend of yours this morning if you haven't discovered this Psalm. Most people only know the 15th verse. That's when you read when when someone dies that you love. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. That's when a Christian dies. But all the rest of the psalm is fabulous, and I'll show it to you in just a second. But we should respond to God's goodness by appreciating it. We should count our blessings. We should not uh, take our natural benefits and endowments and pleasures for granted. We should thank God for them all. We shouldn't slight His word. We shouldn't be casual toward God. Rather, we should reflect verse 12. Look at verse 12 of Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord? For all his benefits toward me. The answer, verse 13, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. In other words, I'm going to drink him. I'm going to participate in him. I'm going to, I'm going to bless his name for saving me. Did you know that's what you're supposed to do at the Lord's table? The Lord's table is not an add-on to the service that's kind of like, oh yeah, we've got to do that. The Lord's table is a literal worship experience uh, in the tabernacle this table uh, of showbread which had unleavened bread like our communion bread that showbread was called the bread of the face and the priest would come in and stand on one side of the table and God was on the other and so when you're coming to the Lord's table you're literally coming and God is, is sitting on one side of this table and you're sitting on the other and God is meeting with you for a meal and what does he want from you? he wants you to render thanks he wants you to, verse 13, call on his name Drink of Him. Thank Him for what He has done. That's not all. Look at verse 14. He wants us not only to drink Him in worshiping His salvation, but verse 14, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. He wants us to obey Him. Keep our word to Him. If you said you're going to meet with Him, meet with Him. If you say you're going to give your life to Him, give your life to Him. Obey Him. Look at verse 16. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. He wants us to serve Him. Verse 17, I'll offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. He wants us to be thankful. Verse 18, I'll pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of His people. He wants us to live every day walking before His sight. He sees us. And how does He do that? Well, it says in verse 8, kind of what is in all of our hearts. Look at Psalm 116, verse 8. You have delivered my soul from death. My eyes from tears. 
I no longer am sad, think my life is worthless. I'm not restless. I don't doubt why you made me. My feet from falling were more than conquerors through Christ. Therefore, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What does he want us to do? He wants us to follow him. So we follow him. We obey him. We serve him. We thank him. We live in his sight all as we drink this cup that reminds us of our salvation. Are you doubting God's goodness? You doubt God's goodness when you don't come to Him for refuge, when you don't learn His ways, when you don't walk in His ways, when you don't thank Him for how He made you and where He has led you, and when you don't yield to Him the reins of your life and say, I want your way more than my own. Teach me your way. I will walk in it. No good thing will you withhold from me if I walk that way.